Part One of Electra by Sophocles, translated by Lewis Campbell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. Old Man, read by Algy Pug. Orestes, read by David Goldfarb. Electra, sister of Orestes. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Chorus of Argive Women. Read by Lauren McCullough. Chrysothemis, sister of Orestes and Electra. Read by Roseanne Schmidt. Clytemnestra. Read by Philippa. Aegisthus. Read by Matthew Rees. Narrated by Elizabeth Clett. Scene. Mycenae. Before the Palace of the Pelopidae. Part One. Orestes and the old man, Pylades is present. Son of the king, who led the Archean host here while beleaguering Troy, tis thine today to see around thee what through many a year thy forward spirit hath sighed for. Argolus lies here before us, hallowed as the scene of Io's wildering pain. Yonder, the mart named from the wolf slain god, and there, to our left, here is famed in temple, for we reach the bourne of far-renowned Mekinae, rich in gold, and Pelops' fatal roofs before us rise, haunted with many horrors, whence my hand, thy murdered sire then lying in his gore, received thee from thy sister, and removed where I have kept thee safe, and nourished thee to this bright manhood thou dost bear to be the avenger of thy father's bloody death. Wherefore, Orestes, and thou, Pylades, dearest of friends, though from a foreign soil, prepare your enterprise with speed. Dark night is vanished with her stars, and day's bright orb hath waked the birds of born into full song. Now then, ere foot of man go forth, ye two knit counsels. Tis no time for shy delay, the very moment for your act is come. Kind, faithful friend, how well thou makest appear thy constancy and service to our house. As some good steed, aged but nobly bred, slacks not his spirit in the day of war, but points his ears to the fray, even so dost thou press on and urge thy master in the van. Hear then our purpose, and if aught thy mind keenly attent discerns of weak or crude in this I now set forth, admonish me. I, when I visited the Pythian shrine oracular, that I might learn whereby to punish home the murderers of my sire, had word from Phoebus which you straight shall hear. No shielded host, but thine own craft, O king, the righteous death-blow to thine arm shall bring. Then, since the will of heaven is so revealed, go thou within, when opportunity shall marshal thee the way, and gathering all their business, bring us certain cognizance. Age and long absence are a safe disguise. They never will suspect thee who thou art. And let thy tale be that another land, Phocus, hath sent thee forth, and Phanotius, than whom they have no mightier help in war. Then, prefaced with an oath, declare thy news. Orestes' death by dire mischance, down rolled from wheel-borne chariot in the Pythian course. So let the fable be devised, while we, as Phoebus ordered, with luxuriant locks shorn from our brows, and fair libations, crown my father's sepulchre, and thence return, bearing aloft the shapely vase of bronze that's hidden hard by in brushwood, as thou knowest, and bring them welcome tidings, that my form is fallen ere now to ashes in the fire. How should this pain me, in pretense being dead, really to save myself and win renown? No saying bodes men ill that brings them gain. Oft have I known the wise, dying in word, return with glorious salutation home. So, lightened by this rumour, shall mine eye blaze yet like bale-star on mine enemies. O oh, native earth, and gods that hold the land, accept me here and prosper this my way. Thou too, paternal hearth, to thee I come, justly to cleanse thee by behest from heaven. Send me not bootless gods, but let me found a wealthy line of fair posterity. I have spoken. To thy charge, and with good heed perform it. 
we go forth the occasion calls great taskmaster of enterprise to men woe for my hapless lot hark from the doors my son methought they came a moaning cry as of some maid within can it be poor electra shall we stay and list again the lamentable sound not so before all else begin the attempt to execute apollo's sovereign will pouring libation to thy sire this makes victory ours and our success assured exeunt enter electra o purest light and air by earth alone measured and limitable how oft have ye heard many a piercing moan many a blow full on my bleeding breast when gloomy night hath slackened pace and yielded to the day and through the hours of rest ah well tis known to my sad pillow in yon house of woe what vigil of scant joyance keeping whiles all within are sleeping for my dear father without stint i groan whom not in bloody fray the war-god in the stranger land received with hospitable hand but she that is my mother and her groom as woodmen fell the oak cleft through the skull with murdering stroke and o'er this gloom no ray of pity save from only me goes forth on thee my father who didst die a cruel death of piteous agony but ne'er will i cease from my crying and sad morning lay while i behold the sky glancing with myriad fires o'er this fair day but like some brood bereaved nightingale with far-heard wail here at my father's door my voice shall sound o home beneath the ground hades unseen and dread persephone and darkling hermes and the curse revered and ye erinyes of mortals feared daughters of heaven that ever see who die unjustly who are wronged to the bed of those they wed avenge our father's murder on his foe aid us and send my brother to my side alone i cannot longer bide the oppressive strain of strength or mastering woe o oh, sad electra child of a lost mother why still flow unceasingly with lamentation wild for him who through her treachery beguiled inveigled by a wife's deceit fallen at the foul adulterer's feet most impiously was quelled long years ago perish the cause if i may lawfully pray so o oh, daughters of a noble line ye come to soothe me from my troublous woe i see i know your love is not unrecognized of mine but yet i will not seem as i forgot or cease to mourn my hapless father's lot o oh, of all love that ever may you move this only boon i crave leave me to rave lament nor praying breath will raise thy sire our honored chief from that dim multitudinous gulf of death Beyond the mark do grief that measure it, still pining with excess of pain. Thou urgest lamentation vain, that from thy woes can bring thee no relief. Why hast thou set thy heart on unavailing grief? Senseless were he who lost from thought a noble father lamentably slain. I love thy strain, bewildered mourner, bird divinely taught, for Itis, Itis, ever heard to pine. O Niobe, I hold thee all divine, of sorrow's queen, who with all tearful mien and sepulchred in stone I makest moan. Not unto thee alone hath sorrow come, daughter, that thou shouldst carry grief so far beyond those dwellers in the palace home, who of thy kindred are, and own one source with thee. What life hath she, Christothemis, and Iphianassa bright? and he whose light is hidden afar from taste of horrid doom. Youthful Orestes, who shall come to fair Mycenae's glorious town, welcomed as worthy of his sire's renown, sped by great Zeus with kindly thought, and to this land with happiest omen brought? Awaiting him I endlessly endure, unwed and childless still I go, 
with tears and constant flow, girt round with misery that finds no cure. But he forgets his wrong and all my teaching. What message have I sent beseeching, but baffled flies back idly home? Ever he longs, he saith, but longing will not come. Take heart, dear child, still mighty in the sky is Zeus, who ruleth all things and surveys. Commit to him thy grief that surgeth high, and walk in safer ways. Let not hate vex thee sore, nor yet ignore the cause of hate and sorrow in thy breast. Time bringeth rest, all is made easy through his power divine. The heir of Agamemnon's line, who dwells by Chrysa's pastoral strand, shall yet return unto his native land, and he shall yet regard his own, who reigns beneath upon his Stygian throne. Meanwhile my life falls from me in despair. Years pass and patience not avails. My heart within me fails. Orphaned I pine without protecting care, and like a sojourner all unregarded, at slave-like labour unrewarded, I toil within my father's hall, thus meanly attired, and starved a, a table-serving thrall. Sad was thy greeting when he reached the strand. Piteous thy crying where thy father lay, on that fell day when the bronze edge with dire effect was driven. By craft was planned, by frenzied lust the blow was given, mother and father of a monstrous birth, whether a god there wrought, or mortal of the earth. O oh, day beyond all days that yet have rolled most hateful in thy course of light! O oh, horror of that night! O oh, hideous feast aboard, not to be told! How could I bear it when my father's eye saw death advancing from the ruthless pair, conjoint in cruel villainy, by whom my life was plunged in black despair? Oh, to the workers of such deeds as these may great Olympus lord return of evil still afford, nor let them wear the gloss of sovereign ease. Take thought to keep thy crying within bound. Doth not thy sense enlighten thee to see how recklessly even now thou winnest undeserved woe? Still art thou found to make thy misery overflow through self-bred gloomy strife. But not for long shall one alone prevail who strives against the strong. Twas dire oppression taught me my complaint. I know my rage a quenchless fire. But not, however dire, shall visit this my frenzy with restraint, or check my lamentation while I live. Dear friends, kind women of true Argive breed, say, who can timely counsel give, or word of comfort suited to my need? Beyond all cure shall this my cause be known. No counsels more. Ah, leave, vain comforters, and let me grieve with ceaseless pain unmeasured in my moan. With kind intent, full tenderly my words are meant. Like a true mother pressing heart to heart, I pray thee, do not aggravate thy smart. But have my miseries a measure? Tell! Can it be well to pour forgetfulness upon the dead? Hath mortal head conceived a wickedness so bold? Oh, never may such brightness shine for me, nor let me be peaceful be with aught of good my life's may still enfold. If from wide echoing of my father's name the wings of keen lament I must withhold, sure holy shame and pious care would vanish among men, if he mere earth and nothingness must lie in darkness, and his foes shall not again render him blood for blood in amplest penalty. Less from our own desires, my child, we came, than for thy sake. But if we speak amiss, take thine own course. We still will side with thee. Full well I feel that too impatiently I seem to multiply the sounds of woe. Yet suffer me, dear women, mighty force compels me. Who that had a noble heart and saw her father's cause as I have done, by day and night more outraged, could refrain? Are my woes lessening? Are they not in bloom? My mother, full of hate and hateful proved, whilst I in my own home must dwell with these, my father's murderers, and by them be ruled, dependent on their bounty even for bread. And then what days suppose you I must pass, 
when I behold Aegisthus on the throne that was my father's, when I see him wear such robes and pour libations by the hearth where he destroyed him, lastly, when I see their crowning insolence, our regicide laid in my father's chamber beside her, my mother, if she still must bear the name when resting in those arms, her shame is dead. She harbours with blood-guiltiness, and fears no vengeance, but as laughing at the wrong. She watches for the hour wherein with guile she killed our sire, and orders dance and mirth that day of the month, and joyful sacrifice of thanksgiving. But I, within the house, beholding weep and pine, and mourn that feast of infamy, called by my father's name, all to myself for not even grief may flow as largely as my spirit would desire. That so-called princess of a noble race or crows my wailing with loud obloquy. Hilding, are you alone in grief? Are none mourning for loss of fathers but yourself? For the blessed gods, ill may you thrive and ne'er find cure of sorrow from the powers below. So she insults. Unless she hear one say, Orestes will arrive. Then, standing close, she shouts like one possessed into mine ear, These are your doings, this your work I trow. You stole Orestes from my grip and placed his life with fosterers, but you shall pay full penalty. So harsh is her exclaim. And he, at hand, the husband she extols, hounds on the cry, that prince of cowardice, from head to foot one mass of pestilent harm, tongue doughty champion of this woman's war. I, for Orestes, ever languishing to end this, am undone, for evermore intending, still delaying, he wears out all hope, both here and yonder. How, then, friends, can I be moderate, or feel the touch of holy resignation? Evil fruit cannot but follow on a life of ill. Say, is Aegisthus near while thus you speak? Or hath he left the palace? We would know. Most surely. Never think if he were by I could stray out of door. He is abroad. Then with less fear I may converse with thee. Ask what you will, for he is nowhere near. First of thy brother I beseech thee tell, how deemest thou? Will he come, or still delay? His promise comes, but still performance sleeps. Well may he pause who plans a dreadful deed. I paused not in his rescue from the sword. Fear not, he will besteed you, he is true. But for that faith my life had soon gone by. No more! I see approaching from the house thy sister by both parents of thy blood. Christothemis, in her hand an offering, such as old custom yields to those below. Enter Chrysothemis. What converse keeps thee now beyond the gates, dear sister? Why this talk in the open day? Wilt thou not learn after so long to cease from vain indulgence of a bootless rage? I know in my own breast that I am pained by what thou grievest at, and if I had power, my censure of their deeds would soon be known. But in misfortune I have chosen to sail with lowered canvas, rather than provoke with puny strokes invulnerable foes. I would thou didst the like, though I must own the right is on thy side and not on mine. But if I mean to dwell at liberty, I must obey in all the stronger will. Tis strange and pitiful. Thy father's child can leave him in oblivion and subserve the mother. All thy schooling of me springs from her suggestion, not of thine own wit. Sure, either thou art senseless, or thy sense deserts thy friends. Treason or dullness, then, choose. You declared but now, if you had strength, you would display your hatred of this pair. Yet, when I plan full vengeance for my sire, you aid me not, but turn me from the attempt. What's this but adding cowardice to evil? 
for tell me, or be patient till I show, what should I gain by ceasing this my moan? I live to vex them. Though my life be poor, yet that suffices, for I honour him, my father, if affection touch the dead. You say you hate them, but belie your word, consorting with our father's murderers. I, then, were all the gifts in which you glory laid at my feet, will never more obey this tyrant power. I leave you your rich board and life of luxury. Ne'er be it mine to feed on dainties that would poison my heart's peace. I care not for such honour as thou hast. Nor wouldst thou care if thou wert wise. But now, having the noblest of all men for sire, be called thy mother's offspring, so shall most discern thine infamy and traitorous mind to thy dead father and thy dearest kin. No anger we entreat. Both have said well, if each would learn of other, and so do. For my part, women, use hath seasoned me to her discourse. Nor had I spoken of this, had I not heard a horror coming on that will restrain her from her endless moan. Come, speak it forth, this terror. I will yield if thou canst tell me worse than I endure. I'll tell thee all I know. If thou persist in these thy wailings, they will send thee far from thine own land, and close thee from the day, where in a rock-hewn chamber thou mayst chant thine evil orisons in darkness drear. Think of it, while there's leisure to reflect, or if thou suffer, henceforth blame me not. And have they so determined on my life? This certain, when Aegisthus comes again. If that be all, let him return with speed. Unhappy! Why this curse upon thyself? If this be their intent, why let him come? To work such harm on thee? What thought is this? Far from mine eye to banish all your brood. Art not more tender of the life thou hast? Fair to a marvel is my life, I trow. It would be. Couldst thou be advised for good? Never advise me to forsake my kin. I do not. Only to give place to power. Thine be such flattery. Tis not my way. Sure. To be wretched by rashness is not well. Let me be wrecked in venging my own sire. I trust his pardon for my helplessness. Such talk hath commendation from the vile. Wilt thou not listen? Wilt thou ne'er be ruled? No, not by thee. Let me not sink so low. Then I will hie me on mine, errand straight. Stay, whither art bound? For whom to spend those gifts? Sent by my mother to my father's tomb to pour libations to him. How? To him? Most hostile to her of all souls that are. Who perished by her hand, so thou wouldst say? What friend hath moved her? Who hath cared for this? Methinks twas some dread vision seen by night. Gods of my father, oh, be with me now! What? Art thou hopeful from the fear I spake of? Tell me the dream, and I will answer thee. I know but little of it. Speak but that. A little word hath often times been the cause of ruin or salvation unto men. Tis said she saw our father's spirit come once more to visit the abodes of light. Then take and firmly plant upon the heart the scepter which he bore of old, and now Aegisthus bears, and out of this upspring a burgeon shoot that shadowed all the ground of loved Mycenae. So I heard the tale told by a maid who listened when the queen made known her vision to the god of day, but more than this I know not, save that I am sent by her through terror of the dream. And I beseech thee by the gods we serve to take my counsel and not rashly fall. If thou repel me now, the time may come when suffering shall have brought thee to my side. <sighs> Now, dear Chrysothemis, of what thou bearest let nothing touch his tomb. Tis impious and criminal to offer to thy sire rites and libations from a hateful wife. Then cast them to the winds, or deep in dust conceal them, where no particle may reach his resting-place, but lie in store for her when she goes underground. Sure were she not most hardened of all women that have been, she ne'er had sent these loveless offerings to grace the sepulchre of him she slew. 
For think how likely is the buried king to take such present kindly from her hand, who slew him like an alien enemy, dishonoured even in death, and mangled him and wiped the death-stain with his flowing locks. Sinful purgation! Think you that you bear in these cold gifts atonement for her guilt? It is not possible. Therefore let be. But take a ringlet from thy comely head, and this from mine that lingers on my brow, longing to shade his tomb. Ah, oh, give it to him, all I can give, and this my maiden so not daintily adorned as once erewhile. Then humbly kneeling, pray that from the ground he would arise to help us gainst his foes, and grant his son Orestes with high hand strongly to trample on his enemies, that in our time to come from ampler stores we may endow him than are ours to-day. I cannot but imagine that his will hath part in visiting her sleep with fears. But howsoe'er I pray thee, sister mine, do me this service, and thyself, and him, dearest of all the world to me and thee, the father of us both who rests below. She counsels piously, and though, dear maid, if thou art wise, will do her bidding here. Yet when a thing is right, it is not well idly to wrangle, but to act with speed. O oh, dear friends, in this mine enterprise, let me have silence from your lips, I pray, for should my mother know of it, sharp pain will follow yet my bold, adventurous feet. Exit Chrysothemis. An erring seer am I, of sense and wisdom born, if this prophetic power of right, overtaking the offender, come not nigh, ere many an hour be born. Yon vision of the night that lately breathed into my listening ear hath freed me, O oh, my daughter, from all fear. Sweet was that bodement, he doth not forget, the Achaean lord that gave thee being, not yet the bronze and riding axe, edged like a spear, hungry and keen, though dark with stains of time, that in the hour of hideous crime quelled him with cruel butchery. That too remembers and shall testify. From ambush deep in dread, with power of many a hand and many hastening feet shall spring, the fury of the adamantine tread, visiting Argive land, swift recompense to bring for eager dalliance of a blood-stained pair, unhallowed, foul, forbidden, no omen fair, their impious course hath fixed this in my soul, not but black portents full of blame shall roll before their eyes that wrought or aided there. Small force of divination would there seem, in prophecy or solemn dream, should not this vision of the night reach harbor in reality aright. O chariot course of Pelops full of toil, how wearisome and sore hath been thy issue of our native soil! Since from the golden oar hurled to the deep afar, Mertilius sank and slept, cruelly plucked from that fell chariot floor, this house unceasingly hath kept crime and misfortune melting evermore. Enter Clytemnestra. Again you are let loose and range at will. I, for Aegisthus is not here, who barred your rashness from defaming your own kin beyond the gates. But now he's gone from home, you heed not me, though you have noised abroad that I am bold in crime and domineer outrageously oppressing thee and thine. I am no oppressor, but I speak thee ill, for thou art ever speaking ill of me, still holding forth thy father's death that I have done it. So I did. I know it well, that I deny not, for not I alone but justice slew him. And if you had sense to side with justice ought to be your part. For who but he, of all the Greeks, your sire, for whom you whine and cry, who else but he took heart to sacrifice unto the gods thy sister, having less of pain, I trow, in getting her, than I that bore her knew. Come, let me question thee. On whose behalf slew he my child? Was for the Argive host? What right had they to traffic in my flesh? Menelaus was his brother. Wilt thou say he slew my daughter for his brother's sake? 
How then should he escape me? Had not he, Menelaus, children twain, begotten of her whom to reclaim that army sailed to Troy? Was death then so enamoured of my seed that he must feast thereon and let theirs live? Or was the God-abandoned father's heart tender toward them and cruel to my child? Doth this not argue an insensate sire? I think so, though your wisdom may demur. And could my lost one speak, she would confirm it. For my part, I can dwell on what I have done without regret. You, if you think me wrong, bring reasons forth and blame me to my face. Thou canst not say this time that I began, and brought this on me by some taunting word. But so you'd suffer me, I would declare the right both for my sister and my sire. Thou hast my sufferance, nor would hearing vex if ever thus you tuned your speech to me. Then I will speak. You say you slew him. Where could there be found confession more depraved, even though the cause were righteous? But I'll prove no rightful vengeance drew thee to the deed, but the vile bands of him you dwell with now. Or ask the huntress Artemis what sin she punished when she tied up all the winds round Aulis. I will tell thee, for her voice thou ne'er mayst hear. Tis rumoured that my sire, sporting within the goddess' holy ground, his foot disturbed a dappled heart, whose death drew from his lips some rash and boastful word. Wherefore Latona's daughter in fell wrath stayed the army, that in quittance for the deer my sire should slay at the altar his own child. So came her sacrifice. The Achaean fleet had else no hope of being launched to Troy, nor to their homes. Wherefore, with much constraint and painful urging of his backward will, hardly he yielded, not for his brother's sake. But grant thy speech were sooth, and all were done in aid of Menelaus. For this cause hadst thou the right to slay him? What high law ordaining? Look to it in establishing such precedent thou dost not lay in store repentance for thyself. For if by right one die for one, thou first wilt be destroyed if justice find thee. But again observe the hollowness of thy pretended plea. Tell me, I pray, what cause thou dost uphold in doing now the basest deed of all, chambered with the blood guilty, with whose aid thou slewest our father in that day. For him you now bear children ousting from their right the stainless offspring of a holy sire. How should this plead for pardon? Wilt thou say that thou dost venge thy daughter's injury? O oh, shameful plea! Where is the thought of honour if foes are married for a daughter's sake? Enough! No words can move thee. Thy rash tongue with checkless clamour cries that we revile our mother. Nay, no mother! But the chief of tyrants to us, for my life is full of weariness and misery from thee and from thy paramour. While he abroad, Orestes, our one brother, who escaped hardly from thy attempt, unhappy boy, wears out his life, victim of cross mischance. Oft hast thou taunted me with fostering him to be thy punisher, and this be sure had I but strength I had done. Now for this word proclaim me what thou wilt evil in soul, or loud in cursing, or devoid of shame. For if I am infected with such guilt, methinks my nature is not fallen from thine. Looking at Clytemnestra. I see her fuming with fresh wrath. The thought of justice enters not her bosom now. What thought of justice should be mine for her, who at her age can so insult a mother? Will shame withhold her from the wildest deed? Not unashamed, assure thee, I stand here little as thou mayst deem it. Well I feel my acts untimely and my words unmeet, but your hostility and treatment force me against my disposition to this course. Harsh ways are taught by harshness. Brazen thing! Too true it is that words and deeds of mine are evermore informing thy harsh tongue. The shame is yours. 
because the deeds are yours. My words are but their issue and effect. By sovereign Artemis, whom still I serve, you'll rue this boldness when Aegisthus comes. Oh, see now, your anger bears you off, and ne'er will let you listen, though you gave me leave. Must I not even sacrifice in peace from your harsh clamour when you've had your say? I have done. I check thee not. Go, sacrifice. Accuse me not of hindering piety. To an attendant. Then lift me up those fruitful offerings. While to Apollo, before whom we stand, I raise my supplication for release from doubts and fears that shake my bosom now. And, O oh, defender of our house, attend my secret utterance. No friendly ear is that which hearkens for my voice. My thought must not be blazoned with her standing by, lest through her envious and wide babbling tongue she fill the city full of wild surmise. List, then, as I shall speak, and grant the dreams whose twofold apparition I to-night have seen, if good their bodement, be fulfilled. If hostile, turn their influence on my foes, and yield not them their wish that would by guile thrust me from this high fortune, but vouchsafe that ever thus, exempt from harms, I rule the Atreides' home and kingdom in full life, partaking with the friends I live with now all fair prosperity, and with my children, save those who hate and vex me bitterly. Lycaean Phoebus, favourably hear my prayer, and grant to all of us our need. More is there which, though I be silent here, a god should understand. No secret thing is hidden from the all-seeing sons of heaven. Enter the old man. Kind dames and damsels, may I clearly know if these be King Aegisthus' palace halls? They are, sir. You yourself have guessed aright. May I guess further that in yonder day I see his queen? She looks right royally. Tis she, no other, whom your eyes behold. Princess, all hail, to thee and to thy spouse I come with words of gladness from a friend. That auspice I accept. But I would first learn from thee who of men had sent thee forth. Phenetius the Phocian with the charge of weight. Declare it, stranger. Coming from a friend, Thou bring'st us friendly tidings, I feel sure. Orestes' death, ye have the sum in brief. Oh, me, undone! This day hath ruined me. What? Let me hear again, regard her not. Again I say it, Orestes is no more. Undone, undone, farewell to life and hope. To Electra. See thou to thine own case. To old man. Now, stranger, tell me, in true discourse, the manner of his death. For that I am here, and I will tell the whole. He, entering on the great arena famed as Hellas Pride, to win a Delphian prize, on hearing the loud summons of the man calling the foot-race, which hath trial first, came forward, a bright form admired by all, and when his prowess in the course fulfilled the promise of his form, he issued forth dowered with the splendid meed of victory. To, fel to tell a few out of the many feats of such a hero were beyond my power. Know then, in brief, that on the prizes set for every customary course proclaimed by order of the judges, the whole sum victoriously he gathered, happy deemed by all, declared an Argive, and his name Orestes, son of him who levied once the mighty armament of Greeks for Troy. So fared he then, for when a god inclines to hinder happiness, not even the strong are scatheless. So another day, when came at sunrise the swift race of charioteers, 
he entered there with many a rival car, one from Achaia, one from Sparta, two Libyan commanders of the chariot yoke, and he among them fifth, with steeds of price from Thessaly, the sixth Atolia sent with chestnut mares, the seventh a Magnete man, the eighth with milk-white colts from Oeta's vale, the ninth from God-built Athens, and the tenth Boeotia gave to make the number full. Then stood they where the judges of the course had posted them by lot, each with his team, and sprang forth at the brazen trumpet's blare. Shouting together to their steeds, they shook the reins, and all the course was filled with noise of rattling chariots, and the dust arose to heaven. Now all in a confused throng spared not the goad, each eager to outgo the crowded axles and the snorting steeds, for close about his nimbling circling wheels and stooping sides fell flakes of panted foam. Orestes, ever nearest at the turn, with whirly axles seemed to graze the stone, and loosing with free rein the right-hand steed that pulled the side rope, held the near one in, so for a time all chariots upright moved. But soon the Oetians' hard-mouthed horses broke from all control, and wheeling as they passed from the sixth circuit to begin the seventh, smote front to front against the bark and car. And when that one disaster had befallen, each dashed against his neighbour and was thrown, till the whole plain was strewn with chariot wreck. Then the Athenian, skilled to ply the rein, drew on one side, and heaving to, let past the rider-crest surge that rolled in the midst. Meanwhile Orestes, thrusting to the end, was driving hindmost with tight rein. But now, seeing him left the sole competitor, hurling fierce clamour through his steeds, pursued, so drave they yoke by yoke, now this, now that, pulling ahead with car and team, Orestes, ill-fated one, each previous course had driven safely without a check, but after this, in letting loose again the left-hand rein, he struck the edge of the stone before he knew, shattering the axle's end, and tumbled prone, caught in the reins that dragged him with sharp thongs. Then, as he fell to the earth, the horses swerved and roamed the field, the people, when they saw him fallen from out the car, lamented loud for the fair youth who had achieved before them such glorious feats, and now had found such woe, dashed on the ground, then tossed with legs aloft against the sky, till the charioteers, hardly restraining the impetuous team, released him, covered so with blood that none, no friend who saw, had known his hapless form which then we duly burnt upon the pyre, and straightway men appointed to the task from all the Phocians bear his mighty frame. Poor ashes, narrowed in a brazen urn, that he may find in his own fatherland his share of sepulture. Such our report, painful to hear, but unto us who saw the mightiest horror that e'er met mine eye. Alas, the stock of our old masters then is utterly uprooted and destroyed. Oh, heavens, what shall I say? That this is well, or terrible, but gainful? Hard, my lot, to save my life through my calamity. Lady, why hath my speech disheartened thee? To be a mother hath a marvellous power. No injury can make one hate one's child. Then it should seem our coming was in vain. In vain? Nay, verily. Thou that has brought clear evidences of his fate, who, sprung from my life's essence, severed from my breast and nurture, was estranged in banishment, and never saw me from the day he went out from this land, but for his father's blood threatened me still with accusation dire that sleep, nor soothed at night, nor sweetly stole my senses from the day, but all my time each instant led me on the way to death. 
but this day's chance hath freed me from all fear of him, and of this maid, who, being at home, troubled me more, and with unmeasured thirst kept draining my life-blood. But now her threats will leave us quiet days, methinks, and peace unbroken. How then shouldst thou come in vain? O oh, misery, tis time to wail thy fate, Orestes, when in thy calamity thy mother thus insults thee. Is it well? Tis well that he is gone, not that you live. <gasps> Hear, venging spirits of the lately dead. The avenging spirits have heard and answered well. Insult us now, for thou art fortunate. You and Orestes are to quench my pride. Our pride is quenched, no hope of quenching thee. A world of good is in thy coming, stranger, since thou hast silenced this all clamorous tongue. Then I may go my way, seeing all is well. Nay, go not yet. That would disgrace alike me and the friend who sent you to our land. But come thou in, and leave her out of door to wail her own and loved one's overthrow. Exeunt Clytemnestra and Old Man End of Part One